All right, boys and girls, we are back with another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. I'm your host, Ben Dominich. You can email us, as always, at radio at thefederalist.com. Follow us on Twitter at FDRLST. Happy to be joined today by civil rights activist Bob Woodson. You can learn more about his work at the 1776 Project and the Woodson Center online. Uh, Bob, thanks so much for taking the time to join me today. Pleased to be here. I have been looking forward to this conversation because we have so much to talk about. Um, but first, I just have to ask you this basic question. When you first heard about the 1619 Project and everything that Nicole Hannah Jones and her allies were attempting to do with it, how did you feel about it and what was your own personal reaction to it? I was really outraged that they would hijack the rich legacy of the civil rights movement um, and use it as a bludgeon to denigrate this country and engage in such hypocrisy. Um, and uh, it, it, it really was disgusting and, and, and very damaging because of the message that it sends to very vulnerable areas of the black community. I spent my whole life working on behalf of low income people of all races, but particularly low income blacks. And the message that 1619 is sending to the black community is devastating. It, it, it defines the problems as being external. They're saying that the, the problems facing the inner cities of the brokenness in the cities, the, the collection of, uh, of, of, of violence and out of wedlock births is somehow related to the legacy of slavery, Jim Crow. That is just a lie. It is ahistorical. And, and so we, uh, we decided that uh, since they were using the black uh, community and our legacy uh, and, and, and the birth defect of slavery, that, that the messengers had to be led by Blacks. And, and so we've assembled a group of um, uh, Black scholars and activists too, because I think that it's important to, to demonstrate to people that the values of our founders have the consequence of pr improving the quality of your life. It isn't some abstract principle that we discuss uh, at, at think tanks, but it has the consequence of really helping to redeem individuals and restore communities. And so we brought people together whose lives are the embodiment of those principles in action. I am frustrated myself by what I see in the conversation today coming from people who just seem to have accepted this reworking of American history that redefines things in very ahistorical terms. It just is not true, as you know, many historians have, have written, as, as uh, you know, members and allies of you as well have written, uh, that slavery was the motivation uh, for the creation of America and our breakaway from England. It's just not true. And yet this is something that isn't just published in the pages of the New York Times. It's also something that they're seeking to push into the curriculums of public schools across America. What can be done in a situation where this type of a history is going to be used to indoctrinate people in a revisionist view that frankly is not factual? Well, for one thing, we cannot do this by engaging in some argument with the other side. I really believe that experience and, and facts trumps an argument. And so what we are going to do, are doing in 1776, is we want to present an aspirational and an inspirational alternative narrative that, that, that demonstrates the falseness of what they claim by providing evidence, by providing examples of resilience, when they decry uh, 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 capitalism, we want to point to 20 blacks who were born slaves who died millionaires. Some of them even went back and purchased a plantation on which they were slaves. Only in a free society where capitalism reigns could you have such a phenomenon. But most people don't know about this, about the rich legacy of, of, of blacks. You know, there was a someone said that there's a, there were two brothers and they were born to this man and he was very abusive. And one turned out to be just like his father and the other was very different and became responsible father uh, 
to his children. And when both brothers were asked, what was the cause of the way that you pursued your future? They said, both said, my father. One responded to oppression by being like the oppressor or being a victim. The other said, responded with resilience and said, I refuse to be what I'm conditioned to believe I should be, and instead I'm pursuing. So Black America's history is that too. Some of us responded to oppression by being victims. Others decided through resilience uh, to, to achieve and to and prosper uh, in, in response. In other words, the best antidote to disrespect is performance. And a lot of Blacks have a solid history of, of performance. And that's what we want to present to people, an alternative narrative that gives details, children's books, uh, readers, uh, videotapes that, that, that celebrates uh, achievements from the past and in the present. One of the animating elements of today's uh, movement, uh, the, the riotous protests and, and uh, things that have grown out of it in America's uh, halls in terms of uh, firms and companies um, is people are being told to read all of these different books and tracts that engage in some pretty extreme uh, language and demands. Uh, most prominently among those, uh, Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility uh, and Ibram Rex Kendi's uh, How to Be Anti-Racist, books that became you know, bestsellers and, uh, and have been pushed by a lot of different folks. Uh, as something that people ought to read. What do you think of those books? Have you read them? Uh, and what do you think of the actual books that folks should, should read in terms of having a greater understanding? Well, it's, it's, it's even worse than that. The very fact that the Smithsonian would issue uh, a, a, a tweet that says that, that this is whiteness. Yeah. This is whiteness. Individualism, hard work objectivity, the nuclear family, uh, progress, respect for authority, and uh, delayed gratification. If a racist in the 20s were to issue this, they would be slammed and decried all over the nation, but for progressives. And what bothers me is, and, and, and now Rutgers University is began to adapt this as in this English department, it's no longer going to teach standard English that they consider racist. But I bet you it will not be taught in Bullis School or Sidwell Friends or, or DeMatha or any of the schools of the elites. They will not be teaching this dumbed down uh, English curriculum. But, and, and so I find it just patronizing and insulting to say to Blacks, uh, that you can't compete, and therefore we must dumb down the standards for you. And, and so we're going to present an alternative. For example, we talking about in 1943, there were no black naval officers. So Eleanor Roosevelt persuaded the Navy uh, to train. So they took 13 uh, college-trained black men, and the Navy put them through a training course. Well, the Navy said, they're going to give them in eight weeks what they give white cadets in 16 weeks. Mm. Well, when these men found out about it, they didn't protest. They covered their windows of their barracks with their blankets and studied all night. When they were tested, they scored in the 90th percentile. And when they saw they cheated, so they tested them individually, they scored in the 93rd percentile. And then they went on to become uh, officers and serve. I met one who was a rear admiral. And so there are, there are timeless, uh, uh, countless examples of how when Blacks were confronted with injustice, our response was not to complain or say you should dumb down the standards. We demonstrated that the best antidote to disrespect is performance. And I can give you endless examples of Blacks in the face of discrimination and racism responded with resilience and perform. That's what our young people need to be, uh, be taught today in our schools. That nothing is more lethal than a good excuse for failure. And that's what we're providing them. And it's having lethal consequences as, as kids are suffering from low self-esteem, 
devaluing their lives and the lives of people who look like them. And that's one of the reasons why you have the murder rate that is going on now. And for so-called liberal progressive to, to add fuel to the fire by now promulgating um, the expectation that you can't make it. You're just too stupid because you're black and therefore we have to dumb down the rules. This must be challenged and confronted for what it is. It's evil. Mm -hmm. Well, that type of, of bigotry, that type of, of assumption about the stupidity of you know, working class and poor uh, Americans is something that I, I find to be so hypocritical. We have these uh, you know, white elites in, in the suburbs uh, you know, shouting at working class, you know, black and Hispanic cops about them needing to, you know, uh, read a book or check their privilege or things like that, uh, as if, as if them being in uniform means that it changes who they are or the or their race. How do we even start to have a shift in the conversation when the loudest voices in this are all basically? screaming that everyone else is racist except them. Well, I saw in Portland, Oregon right now, you're seeing it fractured because bl the blacks are saying, these whites are coming in and stealing our agenda. They're not even promoting policies or yeah. programs. But, but there's a powerful metaphor. There was a black police officer was talking across the fence to young two young black protesters and they were having a, 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 a very congenial discussion. This young white woman interposes herself between them, says, F the cops. Well, that is a metaphor for what is happening in the nation today. And, and, these, and it was a powerful interview when they both re rejected uh, 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 of this. And, and so, but, but our approach, 1776, we have to go directly around the gatekeepers and go into low-income communities that are suffering the problem. There are 23 children under the age of 10 in less than eight months who were murdered in there, in these communities, as a consequence of police vilification. And it results in nullification, which means police are not enforcing the laws. Only about a third of, the, of these murders where there has been an arrest. And so what we're doing in 1776 is going to those conditions and arming those dissident voices that are within those communities who stand with the police. We have one group we're dealing with in Washington, D.C., the Alliance of Concerned Men. In one of the most violent neighborhoods, they've had 74 days of peace, not a single incident. Mm -hmm. And that's because they recognize that the solution to the problem has to confront the enemy within the community. It's not going to be changed by accusing white people of being racist or nullifying the police. And so what we're doing at the Woodson Center is we're arming the going into the community around the gatekeepers and, and take all of these dissident voices uh, and, and let them know that there's a landing spot and we're going to you give them the means to speak for themselves. That's the only way to undermine the left, is to give voice to those in whose name they say they're taking these actions. Because their moral authority is derived from being the so-called legitimate voices of the oppressed. Well, when you give those oppressed the opportunity to speak for themselves, it undermines their authority and they go away. We need to stop these corporations from paying ransom to these race hustlers and instead investing in those groups like the one I mentioned that is solving the problems that are internal to these communities. There's got to be a, a shift in this, but we only can do it by giving a voice to those suffering the problem so they can be agents of their own uplift. I know that there are a lot of Americans, white Americans out there who are afraid of being called racist. They clearly have been pushed and prodded by what they've seen signaled not just in the media but by the standards and stances of corporate america to support black lives matter to say that they're going to dedicate themselves to being an ally and the like to me a lot of that seems to be performative if you really wanted to be an ally if you really wanted to help the community in in the city near where you live or or where you work 
what should people be doing uh, and beyond just taking stances and, and posting hashtags online? Well, what we're doing at the Woodson Center, we have about 2,500 grassroots leaders in 39 states, black, white, red, brown. Oh, and what we're doing with a few uh, courageous companies is we want to have some models where give them an alternative way to invest by identifying 10 grassroots leaders in a city that are legitimately addressing the needs that are internal to that community and get a few courageous corporations to write checks to those groups instead of to Black Lives Matter. And if they do it, it will indemnify them because Black Lives Matter is not about to go to any of my groups and accuse them of not being representative of the community. And so we really think it's, it's you gotta point the way for corporations to have an alternative way of, 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 of investing in, in, and in people that will indemnify them and they will not be accused by Black Lives. Black Lives Matter will never challenge some of the groups that are in these communities addressing gang, uh, reducing violence, helping drug, deal, uh, drug addicts to become transformed and redeemed. So th that's, th that's our strategy to provide an alternative for them writing ransom checks to these race hustlers. The issues that uh, are troublesome to inner city communities across the country, I think are well known to everyone, but in particular of late, uh, people have been paying attention to the rising level of crime in a number of major cities, driven by a lot of different factors. I particularly am concerned about the level of, of crime that seems to be acceptable to residents of, of cities like Chicago, um, to an increasing degree, New York, uh, when it comes to saying, we'll tolerate uh, children getting murdered, children getting shot, even in broad daylight, if uh, it, just because that's something that's expected and that we can't do anything about it. You see politicians stand up and you know, blame the NRA or something like that. What can be done to stem the tide of this type of violence and to make it something that is no longer just accepted, where every weekend it seems uh, we're just reading you know, new numbers or statistics that show uh, incredible damage to communities of people just murdering each other? First of all, I don't think there's a level of acceptance in it. It's just that we're not providing them with alternatives. We, we piloted an effort in, in Washington, D.C. over 21 years ago that we think have the seeds to solutions, but we've never been able to get the investment. And that is by taking healing agents. In other words, if you have a, a thousand young people, they're controlled by 10%. And if you were able, and that 10% by 10%. So if you get some of the leaders, which we have, and transform them and, 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 and promote redemption as the Alliance of Concerned Men does, I've got uh, leaders like this all over the country. They have the power to go in and help transform some of these troublemakers. So once you change the character of a person, their characteristic has an advantage, just as if you want to. Um, treat snake bite, you take some of the venom of the snake <laughs> and introduce it into the body to create antibodies. Well, there are social antibodies that are resident in every low-income community. All it takes is mo going in and mobilizing them. If you say 70% of all Black families have a raising children that are dropping out of school on drugs, it means 30% are not. So we go into the 30% of the households that are achieving against the odds in there to find out what is the secret of their success. And they are the source of new innovation. They are the antibodies. So we take what's working among the 70% and apply it to, I mean, the 30% apply it to the 70%. But it takes investment. It takes a belief that solutions exist. And, and right now, um, and so we're, we're recruiting money, we're recruiting people, but the solutions exist. All we need to do is turn to those leaders in the community. But right now, people on the, on the left are investing, they're renting rioters and, 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 and then people on the right are investing in, in, in um, discussions about American exceptionalism. 
they have to do more than that. And that is roll up their sleeves as some of them are doing with the Woodson Center and coming alongside of us and taking some of the business acumen that explains their success in business and help some of these struggling not-for-profits in these communities to exercise the kind of social control they're capable of doing. It's a different way of, of, of approaching it, but the fundamental barrier is elitism. Uh, and so, but, but we, we know from experience that we have gone into communities that have been drug infested and crime ridden and, and, and reduced it dramatically we just need people to invest in this approach. What's the best way to talk about the challenges of policing in America today? What are you, what are you frustrated by when you see the way that these conversations play out in the media? Because they always look for examples of, of, of all the people, there are a thousand people shot by police, only 14 or unarmed uh, blacks are shot by white police or on a 14. And for every one of those people, 270 blacks kill other blacks. And yet the media focuses immediately on the, uh, on, on the blacks when they are a victim. And what this means is that when these four young black men attack a, a disabled teenager in Chicago and beat him mercifully, it was news for one day and the press just walked away from it or when a five-year-old black girl is sitting on her grandfather's lap in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and a bullet comes through, hits her in the head, no one knows her name. So the media is complicit in this, that the only time a victim is identified is when it's white on black. Uh, and, and so um, that's, that's the problem uh, that, that, that we're facing. But there, there is, Low-income Black Americans are really a sleeping giant. They're going to wake up one day and realize how they're being scammed by these politicians that have been in power in these cities for 50 years and where all of these inequities have been allowed to accumulate. In this, and they are using race to deflect attention away from their responsibility. They were the ones uh, who were running these programs. And if racism were the single culprit, the question is, why are black people failing in systems run by their own people? When the goal of the civil rights movement was to put black folks in charge because they would do a better job than the whites who were there before. But they don't have to have any discussion of that as long as they can point to some amorphous institutional racism or systemic racism. I don't even know what that is. Uh, but it's being bannered around. People are writing checks. Oh, I'm going to fight systemic racism. Tell me what that means. <laughs> Give me an example. If white people went to Europe tomorrow or Canada, how would it change the dynamics in these communities where all these deaths are occurring? The more extreme left members are advocating for, you know, not uh, to defund the police, to abolish the police to defund and abolish prison systems, to essentially, you know, tear down, uh, you know, all manner of things. Obviously, the, the attack focus in Portland is on the federal courthouse. Uh, the, it, it surprised me, I guess, how quickly the left embraced what it seems to me to be an extreme vision of, of what tearing down systemic racism looks like, particularly given that from everything that I read and, and know about the way this happens is the people who don't feel like they need the police tend to be rich or tend to be richer. You know, uh, uh, the people who feel like they need the police around to keep order are tend to be people who work in working class communities, uh, you know, the, like the ones that I frankly grew up in. And that to me is, is something that seems totally absent from this conversation. Uh, right. that, that that's, the, you know, where do you actually need police presence to, to keep order? You need it in these communities. Why do you think it's so hard for people on the right, not just Republicans, but, you know, because they're Democrats who are, who are in a pro, pro cops too. Why is it hard, so hard for them to make that argument? Well, because I, I really think um, it's important to, to let the people suffering the problem make the argument. Yeah. 
we should, you know, see the people who believe as, as we believe, very poor at messaging. We have the right message, the wrong messengers. And so, and I really think that experience always prevails against an argument. And yeah. if someone wants to have, uh, I don't engage in philosophical or political debates. I do what Jesus did. Not to compare myself with Jesus, but you'll understand. Yeah. He was approached by John the Baptist's servants to say, are you the one or must we seek another? He didn't pull out his resume and say, wasn't that going on Christmas? No. He healed in their presence and said, go tell them what you saw. That's what we do at the Woodson Center. If someone has said, is it possible to take a predator and turn him into an ambassador of peace? Go over, why would four drug dealers give up a lucrative drug trade to become ambassadors of peace to save their community? Go and ask those people standing over there what changed their hearts. And so we need to be investing in people that have demonstrated that they can promote redemption of these people and then arm them with the resources they need to affect change from within the communities the sort of the allies that I wrote about in the, in the triumphs of Joseph, if it wasn't for the good Pharaoh, there would be no Josephs. And, and a good Pharaoh is somebody rich and powerful who's able to dream bad dreams in good times and not be comfortable with where they are, but look above the, uh, uh, to the horizon and see, I'm troubled by what I see, but I must look to an unusual source. He looked to a 31-year-old, uneducated Hebrew shepherd who was in the prison across race, ethnic, and class lines and elevated him as second in command. We need those kind of unusual pairings today. In other words, if you want to go someplace you haven't been, do something you haven't done. Or as my grassroots people say, if you keep doing what you do, you keep getting what you got. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we really need to, to, to apply some innovation here in terms of bringing different kinds of relationships together. But the, but the main thrust of it is the power to transform America is going to come from low-income Blacks once that sleeping giant wakes up and say these progressive uh, uh, Marxists do not represent us, and they began to expel them, as I've seen it happening on the streets. A, a, a white couple pulls up in a nice car in Minneapolis and has bricks on the back, handing them out to black teenagers, and a black woman cusses them out and forces them to flee. There are lots of people like that black woman who are ready to expel these Marxists. Mm -hmm. We just need to know how to identify them, how to organize them, and, and give them the means to act and speak for themselves. I wonder when you look at things today, whether you are more optimistic and pessim or pessimistic about the future. On all sorts of poll measures, uh, there's indications that people feel like race relations now are much worse than they were, you know, 10 years ago and the like. Um, lots of people will say, you know, this is the worst time ever. And uh, it seems to me that that's pretty ahistorical and, uh, uh, and not really accurate. But when it comes to your own opinion, having seen what you've seen, do you think that the trajectory that we're on today gives us elements of hope? Or do you feel like things are only going to get worse? I, I am more optimistic than ever before mm. because I travel in circles where people whose lives they have confronted the kind of challenges in their personal life that they have overcome. Some of the worst conditions in the, area, in, in, in the country. And, and I am optimistic because I believe in this nation and I also remember the story of, of David and Goliath. I remember who won that fight. I, and, and I really think that the sickest part of the body draws the strongest antibodies. Hmm. 
we just have to know how to mobilize these antibodies and create out of them an entire immune system so that the healing of this nation has to come from the bottom up and from the inside out. But uh, so that's why my model is the Pharaoh Joseph thing. Pharaoh and Joseph have to come together. The streets and the suites must come together to defend this nation and, and cause her to be as great as she has been and will be in the future. For those who want to affect that kind of change, I think that a lot of them just don't know where to begin. They, they don't know uh, what they ought to do. And so out of whatever motivation, you know, like I said, they, they turn to the internet, they try to do things that are performative. Um, they just don't know how to engage in their communities. I feel like one of the things we've really lost over the last several years here is all the advancements in technology that we have is a true sense of neighborhood as opposed to this kind of fictional version of it online. For those who really want to get out and do something to work like that, how do they engage with you? How can they help uh, what you're doing? And what are the things that they should know about it before they begin? Well, first of all, they can go to our website, 1776unites.com, 1776unites.com. And we are mobilizing people, uh, bringing people together, organizations. We have a consortium of people. We have business leaders coming to us, some corporate leaders. Um, this is a struggle, a campaign. Um, but we, we are going to be uh, helping people to identify grassroots leaders in their own communities, let them know what to look for. Uh, but this is, a, this is a fight that we're in. Um, and, but I'm optimistic because I believe in America. I was just telling people that when people are talking all this foolishness, I, I was, did you see the, the, the movie Hidden Figures? Yes. Well, Margot Chatterley, I was in a, a Saturday morning at Mary uh, I mean, a College in Fredericksburg, Virginia. It was a 12, three o'clock in the afternoon, it was a book reception. There was an auditorium with 1,200 seats and it was packed with black families. And her books, and, the, and there were hundreds more, were turned away. The fire marshal had to turn these black families away. Her books sold out in the room, but they also sold out in the local Barnes and Noble bookstores. And, and, the, and I was amazed at the thirst that young black and, and, and black families are to see uh, virtue in action, to be hopeful about achievers. And, and, and you see evidences all over the nation and so I really think that, that 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 made me so hopeful. So we have got to begin to speak to that deep desire on a part of most Americans, particularly Black Americans, to witness and be a part of grace and action and restoration and redemption and transformation. Mm -hmm. There's a desperate desire for it, and we have to meet that thirst and not allow a minority of radicals to uh, influence the majority will of people. But they're there. But we have got to come together, Pharaoh, Joseph's, uh, people who really care about the country. But we've got to roll up our sleeves and do something. We just can't stand off and complain about what the left is doing. We must join the struggle. And we can give you some instructions as to what to do, where to go, what to do. That's what we do for a living. We have for 38 years at the Woodson Center. I want to ask your opinion about a couple of different figures. Um, what do you think personally of Nicole Hannah-Jones? I think she's a fraud. I think she's the very fact that when somebody said to her about the riots, that they call them 1619 riots, she said, I proudly accept that. Yeah. I mean, this woman hates this nation and she hates this country. And yet she's being celebrated. Oprah's getting ready to make a movie of, of this tragedy. It ought to be a tragedy rather than a celebration. Uh, but I just think that people like her, um, unfortunately, she is a product of the universities that have, have taught anti-Americanism 
Uh, and I just wish conservatives who fund them would wake up and begin to withdraw funds uh, mm -hmm. from them. He's obviously changed a bit, but what, what are your thoughts on, on Colin Kaepernick and, and his role in, in all of this conversation? I think he's a race hustler too. The very fact that Nike makes sneaks overseas <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and then sells these expensive sneaks to the kids and the more he bows down and he gets a big check. Uh, he has been pampered all of his life, all of his life. He has never suffered anything uh, but comfort. And yet he's going to uh, uh, sell himself as if he is a suffering black man who's worried about the police of putting him on the ground. It is the biggest fraud. But a lot of these young blacks think the way that they can strike a blow for justice is to buy more Nike sneaks. <laughs> Nike's making millions. What they should demand is that Nike bring those uh, manufacturing uh, plants and, and locate them in black neighborhoods. If Kaepernick really was for those black Black ju uh, social justice, he would insist that Nike bring those plants, manufacturing sneaks, so some of those kids who are out of work could be manufacturing those sneaks in America. So my Nike and Kaepernick have a wonderful hustle. They can be social justice warriors and walk away richer, exploiting kids who are paying money for sneaks that they can't afford. Mm -hmm. And he thinks that's, that's, he's a social justice warrior. Uh, one more thing, and I, one more person, I won't try to get you to encapsulate all of him in, in whole, but it's been interesting to me to listen to some of the things that Kanye West has said in recent years. Uh, what do you think of him? I think uh, I wrote a, I wrote a, a really uh, complimentary um, uh, column about him because what, uh, he's a mixed bag. I think he's a kind of, he's very confused. Mm -hmm. But on the parts that I think he is less confused <laughs> on bringing young people into the church and bring them into Christianity. I mean, he's filling churches. And I think once, and so I think I, in, in, on balance, I think he's been a, con he made a contribution because I've seen young people go inside churches that I never would imagine that they would. And sometimes when you entice people to pursue good, it 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 uh, it'll stay. So I just think anyone that encourages young people to live a more productive, positive life uh, is is good. And, and so I, I I commend him for that. Uh, Bob, I want to thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Uh, thanks for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thank you for giving me a chance to share this. I'm Ben Dominich. You've been listening to another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. We'll be back soon with more. Until then, be lovers of freedom and anxious for the fray.